Um, it's it's nice to have a chance to talk about alfalfa because we're always so focused on corn, soybeans, and then small grains. So I'm excited. Um, I have a half hour here, and we have uh, a number of offerings in both alfalfa and red clover. I'm not going to focus in on every single one, but um, share some key information, help you zero in on varieties that might work for you in your situation, and then uh, direct you to where you can go for additional information. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about here, you can find either on our website here. You can either go to products here and scroll down to alfalfa, or you can go over here to catalog and uh, bring up our 2023 farm seed uh, catalog. That hasn't hit your desk yet. It will here in about a week or a week and a half. So um, most of the information uh, that I'm gonna talk about today, you can find either of those two places, but, but I've added a little bit to help explain how we come to those, uh, how we come to this information. Alfalfa selection criteria, you each have your own, but with most crops, we think first about yield. So a number of components of yield, of course, are just genetic inherent ability, but also the rate of regrowth following a cutting and fall dormancy is somewhat related to yield. Also quality. So factors, when we talk about quality, we're usually talking protein or digestibility. Think about quality, it can be highly manipulated by harvest management. Um, and there are some genetic components, obviously, to protein and these digestibility factors. Um, as far as quality, we do not sell any genetically modified alfalfas that have the low lignin but we do have some varieties that have been selected for high digestibility, so have lower lignin than some other conventional varieties. So at these selection criteria, all of which contribute to the profitability, persistence is another big one. Now, some rotations, you're planning on to keep this stand for two years, but um, uh, we've got other folks who want to keep a stand five, six years. So what's involved in persistence, of course, is winter hardiness, Disease resistance is big. That's how we mostly lose alfalfa out of the stand is, is the plants get diseased. Persistence can be highly manipulated as well by harvest management and also by fertility, particularly your potassium status. I'll start here with our conventional alfalfas. <clears throat> this table is in our catalog and again on our website. So here's a list of our conventional, all conventional alfalfas. And I'm not gonna run down, as I said, every single one. But if you'll see, we'll provide you a winter survival index. Uh, the lower the number, the better it survives the winter. And so these are all uh, adapted to the upper Midwest. Now, some of these are also grown in the Southwest. Doesn't mean they won't perform there, but they're winter hardy. Fall dormancy is an indication of how much it, it grows in the fall after first harvest. And you would think fall dormancy and winter survival were directly related, but they're not necessarily. And you can see fall dormancy down here, the growth in inches after the final harvest. Suggested number of cuttings, the traffic tolerance, which we have information for some of these varieties, and then the disease rating index. Again, disease a big factor in your persistence. So this is also in the table, um, and this will make your eyes glaze over pretty quickly. So <laughs> I put, this, put the slide here to point out, these are the diseases that our alfalfas are um, evaluated for. And clearly alfalfa is susceptible to a lot of diseases. It's a high producer. Um, and because we keep it multiple years as a perennial or short life perennial, and because we beat it up a lot, we drive over it a lot, it is susceptible. So it, we're evaluated for these diseases as well as some of the varieties for stem nematode and P aphid tolerance. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the disease, disease scoring here and we'll come back to yield. Again, I think usually people think of that first. So the disease resistant screening for alfalfa, uh, screening, is done uh, for some most diseases in the greenhouse and for some diseases also in the field. For soybean diseases like Phytophthora, uh, uh, Aphanomyces, they're inoculated. And if you look here, this blender, they're mixing up inoculum to inoculate uh, flats in the greenhouse. 
uh, for anything for stem diseases like anthracnose, they'll be spraying those on the plants here. And so as soon as these alfalfas come out of a breeding program, they look like they uh, would be prompt the prompt the crosses would be promising, they start doing these disease, disease evaluations immediately. It takes about five weeks to do an evaluation so they can run even several runs through a winter time. So when you see those scores on the tables, which you'll see, HR, highly resistant means after they were inoculated, 50% of the plants survived, 50% or more, and on down, resistant to susceptible means only zero to 5% of the plants survived that. So you will see a range of resistant ratings for different diseases for any individual alfalfa variety. So the ratings, once you get a highly resistant, that's given a score of four, resistant given a score of five, and on down. So if you look at the top here, a series of plants, they were being evaluated for a phanomyces race one. Um, and you can see the plant that died, that would get a, uh, that would actually, th they've got the numbers switched here. So I've got to apologize. That's a, the five would get a score of, the, the dead would get a score of one. So, and these have come from our plant breeder. Um, with fusarium wilt, evaluating the field, they're cutting the stems, looking for rot within the stem and going to where five, uh, the severe one is dead. So the, the dead one would receive a score actually of one. So sorry, flipped around. But let me go back to what we're looking at here. So I've gone to the alfalfa disease ratings here. Once again, I don't expect you to scan these at this time. Um, and if you, if you try to, I'll just, I'm just gonna frustrate you because I'll switch away from the slide. Um, same races, but what we have here, uh, evaluating one, two, three, four, five, six, seven diseases. So if each variety is evaluated for all seven diseases, they could have a potential score of uh, five if they were resistant to all for a total score of 35, seven times five, 35 out of 35. So this is the disease rating index then. This is that total you see over here. And you can tell from the second number how many diseases were evaluated. This would have been six potential, seven potential. Um, and then here's the score. This percentage uh, got a score of 29 out of 30. And so obviously the higher the number, the more disease resistant they are. In general, most of the varieties we're carrying have pretty high disease resistance, quite high disease resistance. But I still think it's nice to have this as a comparison from one to the other. For organic varieties, we also have a, a scoring how well they're adapted to poorly drained soils. And we'll come back to that as well, as well as the same uh, numbers and scores that we carry for our conventional uh, varieties. And again, suggested number of, of cuttings. You can always cut more than this, but what happens if, you're, if you have a roadrunner that suggested three to four cuttings and you try to cut that five or six times, you will reduce the life of that stand as well as the economy of each cut given lower yield uh, probably will make it not uh, economically viable. So I am gonna run through just a, a few varieties here and I wanna go come back to yield, which I know is just one of the first criteria people are looking at. These two varieties are Viking 374 HD and our Viking 394 AP are two of the highest yielding and highest quality potential we have. Again, these uh, individual points that I've noted here can also be found in our catalog and online. Um, so they, uh, they're both tolerant of fairly wet soils. I'll show you some yield data here. Um, both are adapted to a four or five cut system. This HD designates high digestibility and the lignin levels are comparable to other highly digestible varieties in the industry, but without um, GM breeding. Um, so the 394 AP, the AP designates a phanomyces resistance, and this has some resistance to races one, two, and three. Um, a race three has been identified. A phanomyces, well, we'll, we'll go on, we'll talk about that. 
has at least three races out there uh, working, particularly in wet soils. So the, the Viking 394 also has sunken crown trait, which makes it somewhat more tolerable, tolerant of uh, traffic and uh, damage to those crowns. Take a look at some yield trials here. This was uh, just this last year's data conducted by Cornell University in New York. They uh, test at two different sites and then they, they do a new seeding almost every year. So this stand was uh, two years old going into three years. What I pulled out from this trial were just the varieties we carry. There were many other varieties in this trial. So the mean and the LSD was calculated on all the varieties in the trial. Um, so we have 2022 20, 20, yields, as well as the three-year average dry matter yields. So for 2022, if we have a star here, that means they were not different from the top yielding varieties in that in this trial, 2021 yields were higher than this. Yields were a little bit lower. They were actually kind of wet this year. And if you look at most university trials, although there are only few anymore that do these trials, includes vernal and it's the old standard check. So vernal is, is a very disease uh, susceptible variety. It's got great winter hardiness, but it, it's susceptible to disease. It doesn't stick around long and it doesn't yield real well, but it's a, it's a benchmark. Um, I also like at the Cornell trial, they um, evaluate the percent stand survival. So there's still 81% of the plants or 81, 82% of the plants of um, two of our top varieties here after um, two full years in the program. So they also express this yield as a percent of the, the mean average. So 141% of the mean average for that trial. The same varieties uh, tested at Michigan State University uh, this last year. Um, this was just uh, seeded this year. So this is a seeding year yields based on two harvests. And you can see here again, the yields here, I pulled out other varieties, um, were not different than the highest yielding in the trial. So they're not statistically different. The, as I said, few universities are still conducting these tests, and we certainly appreciate those who do. Uh, Cornell University, uh, University of Michigan, I'm sorry, Michigan State, and uh, University of New Mexico, interestingly enough, um, still does a variety of tests, which are all irrigated, of course. I showed you the screening for aphanomyces, and, and this is, it can be a big problem in reducing and uh, reducing the life of alfalfa stands where it exists. It's, it's dominant in very wet soils. So not alfalfa's favorite environment by any means. As I said, there are at least three races known, maybe more at this point. And these three varieties have good resistance to aphanomyces. So these three varieties, the Viking 394 AP, which we just talked about, our Blue River Finch and Blue River Red Falcon, um, all exhibit good resistance to aphanomyces and are adapted then to wet soils. Um, and I think you need to consider as well, it's not just that's a wet low ground, but if you've got a field with variability, it's not tiled, you've got some wet spots. Um, if you don't select, I can't say for sure in any given field you have aphanomyces, but it's quite prevalent when you go east of say central Minnesota and on east into Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, just because those soils are wetter it is fairly predominant. And five topra can also be a problem there. If you noticed, um, I didn't mention, Viking is uh, the brand name for Albert Lee Seed. And we recently merged with Blue River Organic Seed. We're now one entity. So we have a wide variety of alfalfa offerings. Um, and we're uh, still learning to see, do we have any overlap? Um, take a look at our offerings for this year. Again, if you go to the website, um, but a lot of choices are available. Um, the other thing about the 394 AP is it, as it moves west, it's tolerant of wet soils, but it also exists some tolerant of saline soils. So I expect it's going to do well if we can, if it moves west, if it moves west too. So another factor we'd look at would be leafhopper resistance. And um, 
these are our conventional varieties. Conventional growers have the option, of course, to spray for leaf hoppers. But uh, my observation has been you don't, scouting is not as uh, regular as it probably should be. So many things to do on the farm and keep track. People not usually notice they have leaf hoppers when they start to see the yellow uh, at the tips of the leaves. And by then, you've already lost both yield and quality. So our conventional uh, alfalfa is 342LH, uh, can fit well into a three to four cut system. This WL358 can fit even if you're going to a higher uh, cutting schedule. And some of our dairy producers are doing this. This probably has the most recent leafhopper uh, resistance breeding in this variety. We also carry organic uh, alfalfas with leafhopper resistance. And I'm sorry, I'll just make a mention and sadly go to my next slide. Um, it's more important for organic producers, right? We can't spray. Um, so, you know, purchasing the genetics that has, these plants have the glandular hairs or trichomes that come out of the cells that disrupt those leaf hoppers from getting down to the, the base of the leaf and injecting their little stylet to suck out the juices. Um, so it, it's super important. Now, it'd be nice if leaf hoppers were consistent in fields. You always know that field five is gonna have leaf hoppers every year, and you don't know that. Leaf hoppers are, fly in, they come in on the winds from the, kind of the Southeast. So it, it's hard to know if you're gonna have them or not. However, I do find some growers have fields that it just seems like year in and year out, they do have leaf hoppers. I suspect that's due to maybe some certain wind patterns or something about the topography that makes uh, the hoppers wanna drop out right there and, and lay eggs. So, you know, you will learn your own fields. Now, my sad story is both of these for this year are already sold out. So, um, you organic growers do know, of course, you have the option um, if no leaf hopper resistant varieties are available as organic to use conventional varieties. And all our alfalfas are inoculated on the seed and uh, they're all with OMRI approved products. So you don't have to worry about that. You can graze any alfalfa variety. I know people who do it any upright type, but the best varieties we think are a four grazer five and matrix. Matrix is available both conventionally and organically. Um, four grazer is really a dual purpose. It has, again, sunken crowns, a little protection from both uh, tractor traffic, wagon traffic, and, and uh, hoof traffic. Um, so you can cut it three or four times a year, but it's great for grazing. The matrix is a true creeping alfalfa. It spreads by rhizomes and it, it can be cut, but I would never recommend cutting this for hay unless you know, your pasture, you just had some excess. And it'll be in creeping right when it comes up. It's an interesting, unusual. So it, it doesn't mean that you don't need to, to pay attention to bloat potential if you are grazing these. Same bloat potential for these alfalfas as for any. So obviously you need a regular schedule of moving. You may wanna feed some kind of bloat guard either as a block or in the water. Um, but these are well adapted and should stand up well for a longer period of time than I'd say some of our other varieties with a crown that sits higher on the soil surface. We carry one non-dormant alfalfa. It's nitrogen brand. It's used uh, somewhat for cover cropping, but also if you say want to seed something with small grains, you have a single year you want of hay. It does grow well into the fall. It's a fall dormancy nine. So you can cut it as many times as it keeps growing and then it will winter kill in the upper Midwest. So I've grouped these just a different way. And again, there, we have a, a large number of varieties and it can be a little um, disconcerting. I've grouped these by harvest schedule. So, you will find this in the table that I showed you earlier. Varieties, if you want to take four to five cuts a year. And I don't know any beef, beef producers that are taking five cuts a year. I'm sure they're out there. I just don't know them. Um, mostly these are our dairy producers that are trying to push that going on a 28 or 30 to 30, 31 day cutting schedule. Um, a four cut system will maintain your stand for longer. 
improve that persistence. If you look at our conventional varieties, we've already talked about these, um, talked about the red falcon as well, and then these two WL varieties, the leafhopper and the high quality. The organic numbers here that are adapted for 45 pets a year, if they're grayed out, that means, again, we're sold out at this time. And I apologize about that. Um, hopefully, again, with bringing these two, two uh, teams together, we'll be able to better predict our uh, organic alfalfa needs in the near future. So for three four cuts a year, we have a lot of produce, beef producers using these, particularly if they're feeding cows and not, not uh, doing feedlot. Reading again, the four grazers here that I said you can cut. Um, you'll see, um, again, these that are grayed out here are sold out, but we still have organic Viking 3800 and 340M well adapted, uh, 3,800, three to four, 340 and maybe, maybe only three cuts a year. So um, we, if you want to make a decision based on what you see on the website or on the catalog, please give us a call, but we're always willing to discuss it with you as well, just try to help you get fit, get a fit for your need. If you see this Honest John here, uh, Honest John is a great buy, and we've, we've planted this on our farm many times, it's got a little bit of red clover in it, um, but a very small amount. Um, and so the, the price structure is good. And we have both of those still available and here available. And here's our nitrogen, the non-dormant, that you can certainly cut three to four cuts a year, even, even in that seeding year. For two to three cuts a year, in conventional, this would be our Viking 3100. Matrix, I have in parentheses here. As I said, it can be cut, but wouldn't be, if the plan is to cut per hay, I wouldn't plant matrix. Um, we, we carry vernal alfalfa. Some farmers just want a hay out there for this year. We all know it doesn't survive very well for very long, but for this year and next year, um, it, uh, it still does the job. And Hardy brand is a vernal type that we carry as an organic number. So red clover, I feel like I'm racing along here, but that's okay. We carry several red clovers for both conventional and organic growers. Our conventional red clovers, we carry a variety not stated. And, and I would guess most of you, if you're on this call, have grown red clover sometime or another. It's widely used for cover cropping, both in conventional and organic systems, but it's actually, red clover is a good hay crop. Again, it's, it dries more slowly. It also has these glandular hairs, um, like our leaf hopper resistant alfalfas do, but in this case, it, this slows the drying somewhat. With conventional red clover, we also have a Freedom MR. Um, so it has reduced stem pubescence or those hairs that aids in dry down. It's a second generation, has better winter hardiness than the first generation of Freedom. And Freedom MR and Ruby Red uh, have higher hay yields than the medium red. Ruby Red is our top yielding red clover. Um, and some people, the red clover will top out at about, in, in our trials, they top out at about three and a half tons per acre as opposed to alfalfa, which in any given year can go, you know, five or six, five or six tons. But, um, we are seeing red clover being used sometimes in a mix with alfalfa where soils are poorly drained, um, sometimes farther north, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, um, where soils are more acidic. And in that case, usually farther north, they are um, uh, wrapping bales for red clovers included. As we move farther south, you can make red clover hay just fine. Um, ruby red will persist a little longer than the medium red. And it, it uh, establishes quickly as well. For organic red clovers, we have organic medium red. And again, it's widely, widely used. We, we send a lot of that out on organic farms for cover cropping and nitrogen fixation. We also carry organic Manitoba. So this was selected under organic conditions. And that's the only variety we have where that's the case. It is more persistent. If you wanna keep this in a hay stand, if you wanna keep it in a pasture, it is more persistent. And it has good disease resistance as well. You can manage red clover in pasture situations by uh, leaving a paddock or two each year, different paddock, and, and 
keep your cattle out or your sheep out and let that red clover go to seed. And if you do that and move those paddocks around your grazing, yeah, your grazing cell, you can keep it in the stand uh, indefinitely by just producing your own seed. So again, go to the catalog, go to our website, and uh, give us a call if you want to discuss this and uh, work toward uh, getting a fit for you and your livestock. Awesome. Thanks so much, Margaret. <clears throat> Appreciate that, uh, that kind of overview. Um, I found it pretty helpful. Um, it was fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a question about um, showing the slide with the alfalfas that are suitable to, for three to four cuts. Would you mind just kind of scrolling back to that? Yeah, let's go back. Sure. And maybe, I mean, this might be and getting into the weeds what? a little bit, but do you have any um, uh, general kind of harvest best management suggestions. I suppose it depends on what what type of, you know, hay you're trying to make and how you're trying to put it up, et cetera. It, but. it depends, yeah, it depends largely on who you're gonna feed is not the right phrase, but, but what class of livestock you're gonna feed? Are you feeding dry cows? Are you feeding uh, wean calves? Are you feeding heifers? So, you know, when we want obviously a higher protein level, you wanna uh, shorten those cutting periods. So, all alfalfas, you would start at a start looking to cut it at a tenth at the bud stage, and then maybe bud to tenth bloom, and then the cycling alfalfas don't vary a lot between cutting schedules. So if you're cutting at 28 days, like some of the dairy producers do, they're cutting at the bud stage. If you want to let it go to tenth bloom, you're probably cutting about 31 or 32 day interval, and you can let alfalfa go to half bloom and still have perfectly great hay for horses that usually get fat anyway, and, um, and a, a dry beef cow. So the longer you go between cuts, the higher dry matter yield you're gonna get, but the quality drops. The, I mean, the interesting thing about forages is there's a, a trade-off. So you'll get more dry matter, but once you get to about half bloom, you're not gonna add any more yield and the quality will just continue to drop. So um, with three cuts, this is very common for our beef producers. Um, they're not so worried about quality. Again, often cows, if once they're dry, they get plenty of quality from a half blue mouth alpha. Um, but if you're going to four cuts, you also wanna avoid the time, I'm gonna talk in terms of the upper Midwest, you wanna avoid cutting, um, about after September 1st, until you get a, a pretty good frost, because if you cut in mid-September, you are weakening the plant, right? You're removing, you're removing that last cutting, but then in the second half of September, you can get regrowth, that's very typical. And then that will, that will die with frost. And so if you wanna get three or four cuts in a year, you're probably thinking of three before September 1st, and then maybe one late September, October after you've had a frost. And of course it doesn't dry real well then, but if it's had a little frost on it, then it, it dries okay. So, you know, looking at that kind of schedule. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. There was a question uh, as well about frost seeding. Do you recommend frost seeding alfalfa? And if so, what type of equipment do you use? You can frost seed alfalfa, but it's, its rate of success is not as high as red clover. So I'm, I'm apprehensive. I kind of shy away from it just because of the cost of the seed. I'm, I want to do everything to enhance an alfalfa stand that I can. And as soon as I say that, I know people that have frost seeded alfalfa into winter wheat and got a nice hay stand. Um, so I, I can't give you a percentage 50% of the time, for instance, that'll be successful. I don't really know. There's um, the shape of alfalfa and red clover seed is very similar. So I expect them to get worked down into the soil similarly. There is a stage for alfalfa seedlings where they're actually more susceptible to frost damage than a red clover is. And what I suspect some of the failures may be due to that alfalfa gets up and going, and then we get another hard frost that knocks some of them out. 
Um, so I'm, I, I don't recommend it. I don't discourage someone who wants to try it, but it becomes a bigger and bigger experiment the larger and larger acreages you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, how about just, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, what were you gonna how say? About, how about just standard red clover? That, that tends to work pretty well. Standard red clover is, is an amazing plant. A medium red and mammoth red is really for cover cropping. I didn't include it here today. It's, it's amazingly successful cross seeding. You can throw it out there. You can throw it out there before the last couple of frosts. You can throw it out there after the ground's completely thawed and you don't have any more frost, as long as you have some rain and it will catch. Um, and I suppose like whatever you have access to, spinner spreader. Yeah, it, I don't really think it matters. You know, some people, they can uh -huh. run the drill and just, just keep it up, spin it on. Yeah. It, it, Obviously, you want to get as even a pattern as you can, mm -hmm. but um, really, it's <laughs> trying to describe it. It's an amazingly versatile crop in that way. Now, you can also frost seed um, white clover. is fairly successful in the pastures. If you've stressed that pasture and opened up some ground on it, white clover frost seeds fairly successfully. Um, I would put them in that ranking. I'd put red clover. Then white clover and, and any of the whites, Lodino or um, the grazing white clover. But the, the key to doing it in the pastures is uh, stressing the pasture in a little bit, as I just said, and opening up some bare grounds so it has a place to fall. And yeah. then third, I would put alfalfa third down the list. I don't know how, I would stay away from bursine for frost seeding because it's, uh, it's susceptible to frost kill. Mm -hmm. Early in the spring, you might be able to frost seed Melanza. I don't have that experience. Got it. Um, and it, maybe this is a good segue um, to our final session, but a good question. Um, <clears throat> maybe in just kind of very high level terms, uh, the best grass species to pair with alfalfa for dry hay. Do you have, a, do you have an opinion there? Sure. sure. Um, pretty, pretty good choices. The top yielders are orchard grass and tall fescue. Um, second, secondary to that would be uh, meadow fescue and some brome other than smooth brome. We've made hay for years out of smooth brome and it makes certainly decent hay, but you get a big flush early in the season. So we have an Alaska brome and we have a meadow brome that spreads its production out a little better over the growing season. So those I would put, uh, I'd put uh, orchard grass or tall fescue as first companions, um, then next meadow fescue, which is very high quality, and then one of the meadow, meadow brome or Alaska brome, any of those four, um, you know, both contribute, contribute to drying, contribute to quality because of the high digestibility of a grass leaf, and um, yield pretty well. Mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, any specific alfalfa varieties that tend to do better in a blend, or are they all pretty well created equal there? They're, they're pretty equal. Um, you know, clearly the, the, the one that's a little off would be the creeping alfalfa. Um, but I still would maybe put that with a tall fescue or a meta fescue. So no, the others are straight. They're all similar upright growth. Um, I wouldn't have any problem putting grass with any of these varieties. Mm 